Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be going over the care of the antepartum patient. Before we get started, as always, I'm gonna ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're gonna love it, so go ahead and give it a thumbs up now. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation and NCLEX review sessions, both part one and part two. You can reserve your spot by going to my website and signing up, nexusnursinginstitute.com. If you're a current nursing student, you're not studying for the boards, you're just trying to survive the program, I have audio lessons available that will help you. You can check them out by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. My handle's the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing, so be sure to check those out as well. Now, before we get started, I wanna start off with a quick prayer. If you're not into that, that's fine. Go ahead and fast forward. And if you are, close your eyes by your head as long as you're not operating heavy machinery. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for another day on this earth. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies. Thank you for this opportunity to go over this information, Lord. I pray for every single viewer, every single listener. Father God, I ask that you please bless them. I ask that you please help them to understand these concepts, Father God. I ask that you please help them to be able to think critically, Lord, so when they come across these concepts again, Lord, they can answer the questions correctly, Father God. Lord, I ask that you please bless them. You bless uh, the people who are... Um, encouraging them, Father God, to complete, whether it is to complete the nursing program or they're done with the nursing program, but to go ahead and get that license. But the people who are encouraging them, who are rooting them on, Father God, who are supporting them, Lord, emotionally, financially, I ask that you please bless them as well. Father God, thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to teach. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this gift. I ask that you please help me to teach this information in a way that's palatable to the students so that they can understand it. They can process it, Father God, and answer questions correctly. Thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do in our life. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. The healthcare provider informs the client that the pregnancy is confirmed based on blood test and Chadwick sign, which was positive during the pelvic examination. After healthcare provider leaves, the client asks the nurse to explain the significance of a positive Chadwick sign. What response by the nurse about Chadwick sign is most accurate? One, it is a spontaneous occurrence of intermittent painless contractions that begin early in pregnancy and continue throughout the entire period of gestation. Two, it is a bluish discoloration of the cervix, vagina, and vulva that occurs as a result of the presence of increased number of blood vessels. Three, it's a softening of the cervix that occurs because of an increased amount of blood flowing to the reproductive organs. Four, it's a dark brown line extending from the umbilicus to the symphysis pubis that occurs as a result of hormonal changes. What do you think the answer is, guys? And the correct answer is two, it's that bluish discoloration we see in the cervix, vagina, and a vulva, okay? And it happens because of that increased um, number of blood vessels. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, the spontaneous occurrence of intermittent painless contractions. What's that? Braxton Hicks contractions. Choice three, softening of the cervix. What's that? Goodell sign. And then choice four, that dark brown line, what are we talking about? Linea nigra, okay? So the correct um, answer to this question is um, answer number two. When reviewing the client's medical record, the nurse notes that the healthcare provider documented the presence of belotment. Based on this finding, the nurse can assume that the client is at least how many months pregnant? One, five months, two, six months, three, seven months, or four, eight months. And guys, the correct answer is one, five months. So we usually will see belotment. By the way, guys, belotment is when the fetus will elevate or, you know, bounce up um, once the lower portion of the uterus is um, um, palpated and then it'll come back down. So that's what belotment is. And we'll usually see this around the fourth or fifth month, okay? The healthcare provider also documented to the client excuse me, the healthcare provider also documented that the client had a positive sign of pregnancy. As the nurse is reviewing the healthcare provider's documentation, what client finding is, what client finding best represents a positive sign of pregnancy? One, palpable fetal outline. Two, blotchy tan facial skin. Three, positive pregnancy test. Or four, fetal heartbeat. 
Okay, guys, so we're talking about positive. That means we absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's a fetus in there and not a mass, not anything else. So the correct answer is for a fetal heartbeat. Now, it could be a fetal heartbeat or visual um visual assessment we actually see the fetus through you know ultrasound right that way we know that there's actually a fetus there that is a positive sign now let's look at the wrong answer choices one palpable fetal outline that's a probable sign okay when we're talking about positive that means there is no doubt that there's a fetus in the womb okay but you know palpable fetal outline just that outline that's probable how about two, blotchy um, tan facial skin? What do you think that is? Presumptive. Three, positive pregnancy test. Probable, right? But when it comes to, again, a positive, it's gonna be fetal heartbeat. And besides the fetal heartbeat, again, guys, um, either fetal heartbeat or actually seeing the fetus via ultrasound. By the way, one more thing I want to bring to your attention. Number two, that blotchy um, uh, tan on the skin, on the face. Remember, it's a presumptive sign, but that's also known as chloasma, okay? All right, next question. The client asks the nurse when it will be possible to feel the fetus move. In the pre of the client, when is a fetal movement typically felt for the first time? One, between 10 and 14 weeks gestation, two, between 16 and 20 weeks gestation, three, between 22 and 26 weeks gestation, or four, between 28 and 32 weeks gestation. And guys, the correct answer is two, between 16 and 20 weeks gestation. So here's the thing, guys, if you go back to the question, first of all, they're talking about quickening, and so that's um, the first fetal movements that um, the patient feels. Um, when we're talking about this, if you look at the question, it says that, um, let me go. It's a preemie gravida. That makes a difference because if this is her first time pregnant, usually they should feel that quickening between 16 and 20 weeks versus um, um, multi gravida where women's had um, many pregnancies, then she'll uh, feel it later. It could be between 16 to 20 weeks. But if it's the first time being pregnant, again, it'll be 16 uh, to 20 weeks, excuse me. Let me back up, because I think I said the wrong thing. If it's her first time, we're gonna see it's 16 to 20 weeks. But if she's had children before, she's ha she's been pregnant before, she'll feel it a little bit earlier, 14, 14 to 16 weeks. So um, having a first time pregnancy or multiple pregnancies makes a difference for you to know which one you should go with, okay? So for this patient, again, this is her first time pregnant, you could tell her she should expect to feel that quickening between 16 and 20 weeks. But again, if she's been pregnant before, if she had multiple pregnancies, it would be 14 to 16 weeks. Make sure you guys know both of those. During the prenatal clinic visit, a 15-year-old client verbalizes to the nurse that the father of the baby's been physically abusing her. Several suspicious bruises are noted on the abdomen and forearms. The client states that the father of the baby is in the waiting room and she's afraid. Based on the client's statements, what would the nurse do first? One, notify her parents and call law enforcement. Two, arrange for her clothes to be delivered and call a shelter for victims of intimate partner violence. Three, secure the client in the room and call the Child Protective Services. Or four, consult the healthcare provider and document the client's statements. The first thing you're going to do is four. This is important. The healthcare provider needs to know this. You're going to report this and you're going to document the statements. Now, Let's talk about why the wrong answers are the wrong answers. Look at one. Notify the parents and call the law enforcement. First of all, um, we're dealing with a minor because she's 15 years old, but she says that she's being abused, but she's pregnant. We don't know if she's emancipated, maybe, may not, but... And maybe the parents may be contacted um, down the line, but this question's asking us what is the very first thing we're gonna do. And I want you to think about it. Even if the parents are gonna be contacted, who's usually gonna contact the parents? The, the um, law enforcement, right? Not you, the nurse or the healthcare provider. 
when we're dealing with children and suspected abuse, what is the first thing um, you're going to do after making sure your patient's safe? And this patient's safe because in the question, it tells us that we've already gotten that patient away from the suspected abuser. They're not in the same room with the patient, so they're safe, right? So once you make sure that patient's safe, what do you do? You're going to notify your supervisor. Patient safety is involved. And out of all of these choices, the closest thing to that is going to be their healthcare provider, which they need to know what's going on anyway. You're going to notify them. So that's why number one's wrong. Choice two, arrange for a close to be delivered and call a shelter for victims of inter intimate partner violence. That may be done down the line, but again, supervisor, nursing manager, somebody above needs to know because again, a patient safety. And I'm telling you, when it comes to these test questions, guys, it's never you call 911 directly. Okay. You notify your supervisor or healthcare provider, and then, you know, um, the authorities are going to be contacted, but this question is asking you, what's the first thing you're going to do? So yes, eventually we can get a shelter, but the question is asking us priority. Number three, secure the client in a room and call child protective services. They're already secure in a room. In the question says the client states that the father is in the waiting room. So the, the um, father is not with the patient right then and there. So the patient's not in immediate danger. Okay. And so the correct answer is four. You're going to call the healthcare provider and document what the patient states verbatim in quotation marks. All right. A 32-year-old, a multi-gravita uh, client presents to the prenatal clinic for the first time during this pregnancy and states to the nurse, I know I'm pregnant. I've already felt the fetus move. Based on the client's statement, what can the nurse conclude? One, the client's excited about the pregnancy. Two, the client's between 14 to 18 weeks gestation. Three, the client is in the first trimester of pregnancy. Or four, the client's due date is will be difficult to calculate. And guys, the correct answer is two, the clients between the 14 and 18 weeks gestation. Remember guys, when um, the woman's uh, multigravity, she's had multiple pregnancies, she'll feel the quickening a lot sooner than someone who's pregnant for the first time. During the interview, the client informs the nurse, I have a son and twin daughters, no abortions or stillbirths. All babies were born without complications. According to the TPAL method, what accurately records the client's OB history? I'm not reading all of that, guys. You see the choices. One, two, three, and four. Tell me what you're going with. The correct answer is four. The correct answer is four. So let's look at it. T, what does T stand for? term pregnancies two two term pregnancies take a look go back to the question it says that she has a son and twin daughters one son that's a pregnancy and even though it's twin daughters it's still one pregnancy with twins so two okay two term pregnancies <coughs> excuse me p is for preemies prematures that were delivered. And if you go back to the question, it says, da, 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 no abortions, no stillbirths, nothing about preemies. So it's going to be zero. P is zero. What does A stand for? Abortion. If you go back to the question and it says right there, no abortions. And then L, living children. Again, the living children, the son and the two twins. So the L would be what? Three. So don't get confused. When it comes to T, your term um, pregnancies, guys, even if the person's carrying um, twins or triplets or quadruplets, it's still one pregnancy, okay? So the correct answer is 4T2, P0, A0, and L3. The client informs the nurse that her last menstrual period began on March 13th and then ask the nurse when the baby's due. Using Nagel, Nagel's rule, the nurse can assume the client's expected delivery date to be approximately which date? 1, November 13th, 2, November 23rd, 3, December 3rd, or 4, December 20th? And the correct answer is 4, December 20th. Why? You go back three months and you add a week. So if you go back three months, because look, it said March 13th, we go back three months, we're in December, and then we add, December, um, we add seven days, 
13 plus 7, 20, December 20th, okay? So you always want to go back three months and add seven days. Next question. The healthcare provider asked the nurse to prepare the client for a pelvic examination. The nurse correctly assists the client into which position? One, lithotomy, two, prone, three, Sims, or four, Trans-Dellensburg. And guys, the correct answer is one, lithotomy. Think about it. What's being done? A pelvic examination. So that's going to be the best position where the patient is on their back, their legs are flexed, their feet is flat, you know, on the table or on stirrups, excuse me, so that um, the pelvic um, area can be examined, okay? When assessing a pregnant client's current medication list on her first prenatal visit, which medication is of concern? One, acetaminophen, two, amoxicillin, three, isotretinoin, or four, calcium carbonate. And the correct answer is three, guys. So I want you um, to think about it. What is this medication? What's the drug class? It treats acne. It's a wonderful medication for uh, treating acne. It works very effectively, but guess what? It causes fetal defects. So if you're pregnant, you cannot take this medication. And so that's why we're gonna be concerned about this medication. The other um, uh, medications we'd be less concerned about, one, acetaminophen, what's that Tylenol? It's an analgesic it's used for as an antipyretic as well. Two, amoxicillin, that's an antibiotic. And four, calcium carbonate, that's a calcium supplement. It also can be used as an antacid. The medication we're going to be most concerned about, because again, it can cause um, damage to the fetus, is going to be um, choice number three, the isotrentin. Before the pelvic examination, what intervention by the nurse is most appropriate? One, give the client an enema. Two, instruct the client to urinate. Three, shave the client's perineum. Or four, give the client a mild sedative. And guys, the correct answer is to instruct the client to urinate. So when you have your patient urinate, number one, it's going to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's more real, it's more comfortable. That's the word I'm looking for. It's more comfortable for the patient when you're doing that assessment if their bladder's actually empty. So it's more comfortable for the patient and it also allows for better visualization of the pelvic structures, okay? Choices number one, three, and four is not necessary for pelvic examination. What method best promotes client comfort during the pelvic examination? One, having the client lift her head off the table. Two, having the client press her back into the examination table. Three, having the client tighten her buttocks. Or four, telling the client to let her knees fall outward. And the correct answer is four, telling the client to let her her knees fall outward. It didn't say knees fall down where your legs would go flat. It said knees fall outward. Remember, um, if the pelvic examination is being done, this patient's in the lithotomy position. They're on their back. Their knees are flexed. So with those flexed knees, if you tell them to let their knees fall outward, they're what? Just opening their legs, right? And that allows for that pelvic examination. And it actually helps um, those muscles relax. Choice number one, Having the client lift her head off the table. First of all, um, with a pelvic exam, they're going to have a pillow under their head and they should not be lifting their head off of the table because doing that is going to cause contraction of the abdominal muscles and we actually want relaxation, not contraction. Choice two, having the client press her back into the exam table. That's going to cause contraction of um, the abdominal muscles, the, the, the butt muscles or both. Choice three, having the uh, client tighten her buttocks. Again, we don't want that. We want relaxation of those muscles. So that's why four is the correct answer choice because the question is asking us about what's going to promote client comfort. Well, those muscles relaxing is going to promote client comfort. We don't want contraction. We want relaxation of those muscles. What fetal heart rate must the nurse report immediately to the healthcare provider? Is it one, 100 beats per minute, two, 120 beats per minute, three, 140 beats per minute, or four, 160 beats per minute? And guys, the correct answer is one, 100 beats per minute. Um, this, if we see 100 beats per minute, that's what, bradycardia, 
okay? Because the normal heartbeat is supposed to be 120 to 160 beats per minute. So if we see 100, that's way too low, we're going to notify the healthcare provider. The client tells the nurse that a cousin's baby was born with spina bifida. The client asks if it's possible to detect the presence of this condition during her pregnancy. What response by the nurse is most accurate? One, FTA ABS test can detect this defect. Two, Hep B service antigen can detect this defect. Three, AFT test can detect this defect. Or four, VDRL test can detect this defect. What would you say? And guys, the correct answer is three. The maternal serum alpha fetal protein AFP test can uh, detect this defect. By, and also, guys, it's done between 14, 14 to 16 weeks. Okay, this test is done between 14 and 16 weeks. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. Number one, the FTA ABS, that fluorescent trypono tr trypanomal antibody absorption test, that screens for syphilis. Actually, number one and number four, the VDRL, that screens for syphilis as well. We do VDRL much more often um, than FTA if the woman's not pregnant. If she's pregnant, we do FTA more often, but if she's not pregnant, we usually do the VDRL. But the point is, they both do what? They screen for syphilis. Um, choice two, the answer is right there, hepatitis B surface antigen. So what do you think it detects? Hepatitis B. This question's asking us about spina bifida and the correct answer is going to be the AFP, the maternal serum alpha fetal protein. Again, that test is done between 14 to 16 weeks gestation. Before leaving the clinic, the client asks the nurse about the schedule for the next perinatal visits. The nurse responds that the, for clients with uncomplicated pregnancies, it's usually best to plan monthly visits for the first 28 weeks and then more frequent visits following which schedule. Is it one, weekly for the remainder of the pregnancy, two, every two weeks for the remainder of the pregnancy, three, every two weeks up to 36 weeks, and then weekly for the last month, or weekly up to 36 weeks and then twice a week for the last month? And the correct answer is three. So um, that patient's going to see the healthcare provider. Remember, this is uncomplicated pregnancy. They're gonna go every month up to 28 weeks. Now, when they hit 28 weeks, instead of going every month, they're gonna start going every two weeks until they get to 36 weeks. And then after that, they're gonna go every week for that last month. The client also asked the nurse whether it's safe to continue exercise routinely throughout the pregnancy. What nursing instruction concerning exercise during pregnancy are accurate? Select all that apply. All right. How do we treat select all that apply as true or false? Let's go. One, avoid exercise during hot, humid weather. True or false? True. Because exercise during hot, humid weather, what does that do? It elevates the body temperature, increases metabolism, increases heart rate. We don't want anything to cause, cause harm to the fetus. So that's true. Choice two, avoid any jerking, bouncing, or jumping movements. True or false? True. We don't want to harm this growing fetus. So do you think it's a good idea to be doing jump, jumping jacks all over the place? Absolutely not. Choice three, drink plenty of fluids before and after exercising. True or false? True, we don't want the patient getting dehydrated. We don't want them dealing with electrolyte imbalance. True. Four, limit strenuous activity to no more than 60 minutes a session. False. And your first clue should have been that word strenuous. Okay, it didn't just say exercise or activity. It said strenuous. Another word for strenuous is vigorous. So we're not doing more, we're not doing that for more than 15 minutes. So, um, it's not more than 60 minutes. It's more than 15 minutes. Anything that's strenuous or vigorous, we're not doing it for more than 15 minutes. So that's false. Um, choice five, perform exercises only in the supine position. False. The fact that there was an all-inclusive word in there, we know it's wrong. I keep warning you guys, stay away from the answer choices that have all-inclusive, such as only, never, always, none, every, right? Stay away from them. They are not the correct answer. And this isn't the correct answer. Perform exercises only in supine position. You better not do any exercises in the supine position. Why? We don't want you to have uh, supine hypotension. We're going to avoid that. So that's false. And last, number six, limit exercising to once a week. 
false. We don't have to limit exercising to once a week. Um, we want you exercising at least three days a week. We just don't want you doing anything excessive, but you don't have to limit exercise to just once a week. So the correct answer choices here is one, two, and three. The client returns for follow-up visits on a regular basis following the prearranged schedule. According to the most recent examination, the client's estimated to be a 20 weeks gestation. Where can the nurse expect to palpate the fundus at this time, at 20 weeks? I know you guys all know the answer. I've said this to you a million times in a million other videos. 20 weeks gestation, where do you expect to palpate the fundus? Is it going to be one, just above the symphysis pubis? Two, just below the xiphoid process? Three, near the level of the umbilicus? Four, just below the symphysis pubis? All right, I know you guys got it right, and it's near the level of the umbilicus, okay? We know at, at 20 weeks gestation, you expect it right around the level of the umbilicus. Um, just above the symphysis pubis, you expect that around 16 weeks. Um, below the xiphoid process, 38 to 48 weeks. That's when that patient, you know, they're near term. Um, uh, just below the symphysis pubis. How many weeks just below the symphysis pubis? Guys, I'm having a brain fart. Let me know in the comments. For the life of me, I can't think and I don't want to tell you the wrong answer. So I'm going to leave that blank because it's not coming to me. But please go ahead. Let me know in the comments. Remind me in the comment section, please. Um, oh my gosh. Just below the symphysis pubis because I can't remember for the life of me. Last question. All right. When the nurse discusses the task to be accomplished during the client's visit at 24 weeks gestation, what test will be performed? Is it the Coombs test, the glucose tolerance test, the PAP test, or rubella titer? And guys, the correct answer is glucose tolerance test. This test is um, done between 24 to 28 weeks gestation, and we're doing it to see if the patient has gestational diabetes. Okay, now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, Coombs test. That Coombs test is to see if there's RH incompatibility between mom and the fetus. Choice three, the pap test. That's not usually done during um, prenatal. Well, let me not say that's not usually done during the pre prenatal visit. It's usually done in the first visit. Okay, so the first prenatal visit, they're going to do the pap test. And they're also going to do the rubella titer. So choice three and four, you, you expect it to be done during um, the first prenatal visit. Uh, and choice one, that is not routinely done. But when it's done, it's done again to see if there's arch incompatibility between mom and the fetus. And the correct answer, guys, at 24 weeks gestation, we're going to do the glucose tolerance test. It's done between 24 to 28 weeks. And it's to um, screen for gestational diabetes. And guys, that is the end of this video. Please let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. Let me know if you would like more videos coming. Something I forgot to mention, these questions were for LPN students. Now, even though um, these questions are for LPN students, if you are an RN student, these questions will still be helpful for you because you need to know this information to be able to answer your type of questions. Your type of questions are going to be more complex. Yes, granted, but this is the foundation. You still have to know this information. So it's still helpful for you guys. Uh, please let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover next or more in depth. And let me know how. Do you want it in a QA? session like this one? Would you like it in a cahoots activity format or would you like it in a lecture where I'm actually teaching? So let me know. Sound off in the comments. Guys, don't forget to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching. You guys catch me on the next video.